Hi, everybody. I am here with Nora Decker. She is a accomplished young adult author, and she is currently working on her second novel. And she's also a professor at the University of Winnipeg, who she teaches creative writing. So thank you so much, Nora, for being here with us. I'm very happy to be here. So I know one of the big questions that I got when I told my parents that I loved English and that I get from a lot of students in my class is what can you do with an English degree? And here you are doing many things with an English degree. <laughs> but um, how did you get into this job? How did you get into this field? How did you come here? Well, um, so I knew from a really young age that I wanted to be a writer. Um, in fact, I like, I think I was five or six and I, I told my parents that I wanted to be a writer or a teacher. So that um, didn't change too much over the course of the years. Uh, and I had, so my mom is an English teacher and one of my, my closest aunts is a writer. So I think that those jobs seemed very possible because of that. Um, now having said that, uh, even though I had a role model who was a writer, it's still not there's no blueprint to follow to, you know, have a writing career. So it still took some figuring. And I, even though I wasn't put under that much pressure by my parents, um, I, I felt the pressure from society, you know, that like, who am I to say I wanted to be a writer? Uh, and I, I probably still struggled with that until the last couple of years, you know, so many years of like people asking me at parties what I did and then me saying I'm a writer and then them being like trying to figure out, but are you really one? Like, you know, like, have you published anything? Mm -hmm. Are you a real writer? And that weird anxiety. Um, so yeah, so like it wasn't so much that other people pressured me more like I felt the pressure myself. Um, and like I said, I didn't have a blueprint for how to become a writer. I just took it one step at a time. So I love English. I knew I would study English um, at university. So I started down that path. Then I, I realized I wanted to be in a creative writing program. So I transferred universities twice, which was complicated and expensive in my early 20s um, and resulted in me taking seven years to finish my undergrad degree, which is pretty slow. But there's no rush when you are trying to become a writer. It's not something most people master when they're 22. Mm -hmm. uh, so it became a question of like, how do I support myself while I grow as a writer? And then I looked for programs to, to do um, along the way that would like help me. So I did this program through Humber College. Um, that's like a year long mentorship program with a writer. And that's uh, how I wrote the first draft of my first book. And, you know, through that, my mentor in that program connected me with his editor at a major publishing house. They didn't publish my book, but they gave me some feedback and, you know, it was another connection. So everything leads to like the next thing. So after I finished my undergrad degree, um, I was like, well, how am I going to become a writer? And I was like, I need time to write. So I started um, living in Toronto. You, it's expensive. So you need to work. So I started leaving Toronto and settled up my apartment for the summer and I stayed at my family's cottage in rural Manitoba and, and I wrote. So, you know, that was like how I invested in myself for a couple of years. Then I decided I needed to go to grad school. That's when I, I decided to, um, I needed like another professional skill. So I um, learned how to teach writing and got practical experience doing that. Um, and then, you know, that leads to the next thing, leads to the next thing. Um, but I was in my early 30s when my first book came out and when I got my job at the university. So um, I don't know if I've, I've told the story to George Vanier students before, but when I was um, in that first year out of my undergrad, I was about 25 and I was, you know, that sounds grown up to you guys, but I was still kind of like an overgrown teenager. And I was working at this restaurant that only serves meatballs. So it felt kind <laughs> of like, yeah, a meatball restaurant. Um, it felt like a ridiculous job to have. And I just remember feeling, my mom's a little, I was gonna say mom's a little more, more supportive than my dad, it's not exactly true, but my dad puts a bit more pressure on me. And I felt like I needed to explain to him that I wasn't wasting my time. I wrote a letter to him, he lives in Winnipeg, I lived in Toronto. I wrote this letter to him that said, I want to be a writer, this is what I wanna do with my life. I think I can, if I, keep investing and keep working hard because I, you know, I'd had very small successes at that point, but I'd had enough people tell me you, you have something. Um, and I said, 
it might seem like I'm a loser working at a meatball restaurant, but trust me, I'm, I got this. And so I was 25 when I wrote that. I was 27 when I, I got a full scholarship to an American grad school, which was you know huge to be able to get my, further my education without going into debt, all these things. So it's like a real combination of being whimsical and practical is kind of how I got here. Yeah, that's so fascinating, right? Because it's, um, you know, anything like writing or creating or art, you have to have that kind of passion and people say, do what you love. But obviously, there's a lot of craft and work ethic and perseverance involved in it as well, right? You don't just create and then people just automatically discover you, right? Like you've done a lot of training, you've made a lot of connections. Mm -hmm. So I think not everybody gets that picture of how artistry is a craft, is a kind of a kind of grind as well, mm -hmm. like many other jobs. Yeah, I think like not, it's not like only the people who don't quit who succeed, but like a large part of succeeding is not quitting, right? Mm -hmm. So just stick to itiveness. Um, and I'll also say like the importance of mentors and like every person who helped me out, whether it was like a kind word about my writing or a connection, you know, or a reference letter, things like that, helped me along my way and, you know, I now pay it forward to my students, writing recommendation letters, um, giving of my time, giving them feedback on writing. And I think recognizing how powerful that is, like the mentor, mentee dynamic, um, will also, like understanding that will also help you get where you wanna be. So this is a question I've asked of multiple different professionals, um, is what does a typical workday look like for you? Is there a typical workday for a writer? Um, yeah, I think most of us like routine, or at least when you are being productive, routine's important. Um, my, my, my routine's different these days, so I like, I don't get up and leave the house. Um, it's important, I think, when you're a writer to figure out when you do your best work. So I'm a, I'm a morning person. So uh, if I'm behaving myself, I'll get up like at six and do a couple hours of writing first thing before I like check my work email before anything, because I'll have like a fresh morning brain that's uncluttered by, you know, doing the dishes and like going grocery shopping and like an annoying email I got from someone I work with and things like that. And you get the writing done and then you, you go off and you do the other things. So, um, yeah, if, like I said, if I'm behaving myself, if I'm not slacking, I get up and write for two hours. I find these days that's how long my attention span is. So I could force myself to stay at my desk for like six hours, but I don't think I'd get quality work done just cause I don't know. Um, it's different in the summers when I'm just writing versus like in the school year when I'm teaching and this year is different again because you know it's so distracting to check the news and things like that but I like to get writing under my belt and then I'll go and and tend to my teaching duties so checking emails there's a lot more emails this semester because um my students can't come to my office hours to ask me questions so we connect that way um I do a lot of grading of essays and then making my lectures. So that takes time too. And I find that to be really fun and interesting. Like my job is to talk to students about books I'm passionate about. And that's wonderful. Mm. So what is most challenging about this job, about being a writer professionally? Um, well, like I said, the fact that there's no clear cut route and timeline to becoming a writer is hard. So it's not just you go to school, you get your first job and you know, you're on your way. So that's tricky and the uncertainty is tricky. Um, the rejection is tricky. So um, I, my sort of advice to myself is to um, always be thinking a few like moves down the line. So I don't have all of my hopes pitted on like one thing I've applied for one grant or one editor, um, but to be, you know, putting a lot of feelers out there so that those rejections don't hit me as hard. I am pretty, I'm sensitive as the next person. So like when, you know, um, I don't get picked for something, it, it's hard, especially, you know, um, and comparing yourself to other people is really hard too. So you see as much as like, I have so many wonderful writer friends when you see them have, you know, a breakthrough or, um, you know, a big success, sometimes you feel a little, uh, 
you get down in yourself. So I just have lots of strategies to try and, and deal with those things um, because it is like such an uncertain industry. And I worry, I worry about these things, but I, the way I deal with that worry is to um, make a to-do list and, you know, keep plugging away. Yeah, that must be definitely something you have to have a real strength of spirit and support to be able to handle, like you say, like all the different you know, I, I think about my job or, you know, an average job where some days I know I did a good job um, and mm -hmm. some days I know I could have done better, but nobody's writing about how I could have done better in a newspaper like they do <laughs> about artists and about writers, right? It's such a public critique. And then mm -hmm. the, the accolades are also much bigger. You know, I, nobody's writing about, you know, this great lesson I taught, but they did write about, you know, you won this really huge award as an emerging writer. Um, is that where the rewards come in for you or do the rewards come in somewhere else? Um, yeah, I mean, winning a prize is certainly like a huge thing that I had. I let myself indulge in dreams sometimes when I'm working on a book and, you know, do imaginary interviews with people in my head, things like that. And I had dreamed of winning a prize. Um, but it's just one of those things where you just kind of feel, you always feel like the same person, right? No matter if, you know, if you're successful or not. So it sinks in slowly. I secretly every once in a while I'll be like doing the dishes and I'm like, I'm an award-winning author. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it you doesn't- You get a medal that you could, you know, wear while doing it. I wish, so maybe that would help to maybe. make it feel real. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so we've also kind of been talking with a lot of different professionals and, and this comes from conversations I often have with students about the idea of in grade 12, especially you're expected to sort of know what you want to be. And even when you're a, a small kid, that's this big question, what do you want to be, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that is such a bizarre question now in this time, in this generation. So uh, did you always know you wanted to do this? And did you have any big sort of detours into other avenues along the way? I did always know I wanted to do this. So, you know, from like an early age elementary school, that was my goal. Um, like if, you know, I, I remember doing like a, a quiz in grade 12 of like what career should you go into? And I think it said like writer, editor, fireman or something like I don't know. I've had moments where I'm like, oh man, I wish, you know, I'm in my mid thirties now and I'm like thinking about mortgages and stuff. And I'm like, darn, I should have, I should have been a high school teacher because those like hours are regular and, mm -hmm. um, and you know, mm, pays reasonably okay. And, and things like that. Whereas, you know, I'm just starting my university teaching career in my thirties. Um, but I love it. Um, uh, so like maybe if I could go back and do things over, I, I, really the only thing I would have changed was to be like more financially responsible, um, which is not what anyone really wants to hear, but that would be <laughs> <my friend. laughs> um, I never really felt like I, I got knocked off track. Like I never had, my backup plan was, was, you know, yeah, like becoming a teacher. Right. So yeah, I've just stayed the course. I think, like I said, I think a large number of people who make it in writing are those who don't stop. So if I had let myself, I talk about that feeling of getting out of undergrad and being like, well, what next? If I had let myself be panicked at that moment, and I panicked a little bit, um, but instead I was like, what is my writing need? Like I, I am able, because I'm passionate about it, to, to um, you know, always put the, the focus on the writing. So the writing is what's important. Certainly I have, um, you know, gotten tired of being broke over the years. Um, but that just made me, you know, think, well, now I've got to start getting grants. That's the way to like get a little bit more money coming in. So no, I guess I never really stopped, but certainly, certainly there are like um, periods where I don't have great confidence in myself or I feel like, you know, the, the yeses aren't coming in, but the noes are coming in. So getting through those moments is hard, but I've never really, any sort of like pivot I've done has been like, okay, how can I, how can I like add a new skill that will help my writing career keep going? So, you know, some of these, I remember enrolling in a, um, uh, like a continuing ed course at Ryerson in copy editing, thinking like, oh, this will be my, this will be my job I do to support my writing. I went to one class and I hated it. And I was like, I can't <laughs> do 
it's making me hate words. And I didn't go back. I like took the hit and like got a refund, partial refund on the, on the tuition because I knew that it wasn't the side gig for me. I knew like, you know, I'd rather keep waitressing, which is what I was doing at the time and like working on my other skills. Cause I just knew I couldn't be happy um, at that job. And then once I started teaching, I was like, Oh, this, I, this, I really love. So this is like a, this is a side career that could feed my writing and go well with it. I feel like that's so um, undervalued the, the idea of actually being able to enjoy what you're doing. I know it sounds like a, it sounds like a euphemism or a dream or something to like say, do what you love. But if you think of how much time we spend at work, how can you, how can you not love some, love it, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise it, I think it, it could crush all that artistry. And all that yeah. So this last question is actually from students. Um, one of the things that a lot of us, I think as a culture notice during the pandemic is we, uh, you know, art can be seen as this sort of undervalued aspect of society. But during the pandemic, when we all got closed down, art was what we all craved, right? So we're all, whether it's, you know, binge watching Tiger King or whether it's reading books and praying for the library to be open again. So what role do you think stories or art have in terms of, you know, human happiness, human survival? I, I mean, as much as the pandemic has been horrible in so many ways, I love that conversation that's come out of it. Like those memes of, of people being like, you know, when a pandemic hits and everyone has to stay home, like, what do we need? We need TV, movies, um, podcasts, music, books, and you know, artists make those things. Mm -hmm. um, and I like, I talked a little bit about the stigma of being an artist that like, even though I came from a supportive family, I still felt like I still was like, who am I to th say I'm going to be a writer? And, you know, um, like what an ir irresponsible career choice. Um, but no, art, we all consume it every day. It's all around us. And um, life would really not be the same without it. Um, I think that I admire people who can write about the pandemic right now, like people who are putting out work about it. Um, I just read this really short collection of essays by Zadie Smith that she put out called In Intimations. Um, and this is like things she's written since the pandemic has started and it part of the proceeds are, are going to support the pandemic. I can't, I think need more processing time than that. Like, you know, so I think if I were going to write something pandemic wise, it'll come out in a year or two. Um, like I said, I admire people who can like work on the subject as it's happening. I think um, I have like all these quotes from different writers swirling around in my head. Um, I think the Joan Diddy one I'm par paraphrasing, but um, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. Like I think um, there's nothing more human than telling a story or being told one. Um, it's like, yeah, it's how we relate to each other. It's how we show like, our love and what we've learned from each other. I just, yeah, I, like I think it's like the, in some ways being a storyteller is like the oldest job there is. I love that. Thank you so much for doing this for us, Lauren, for the inspiration. And I hope next time we speak, it'll be about the launch of your new book. I would love that. Okay, thank you.